This affects everything. Something that we can all do and it's something that's really creating a very positive change. Maybe the solution is to look in the mirror. We have been living in this system of normalized violence and we've been killing animals at such a fast pace. I mean, we kill more animals in four to 12 hours than all the humans that ever died in wars throughout human history put together. Wow. Why did we have to create a planet that looks dead, that kills things, that kills animals left and right, that kills trees, that kills rhinoceroses, that kills, kills, kills. I mean, that's all we do. You know, we're killing machines. 52% of all wild vertebrates died between 1970 and 2010, and more of them died in 2010 than they died in 1970. So you can imagine that there is this exponential growth in the, in the killing of wild vertebrates, wild animals. By 2012, it had become 58%. So if we just follow that trend, by 2026, they're going to be 100% gone. When the earth is ravaged and the animals are dying, a new tribe of people shall come unto the earth from many colors, classes, creeds, who by their actions and deeds shall make the earth green again. We are here live in Arizona at Woo. the headquarters of Voice America Radio with Dr. Salesh Rao, who is a man who was instrumental in the creation of the internet. He is going to use the same process that they used to create the internet to create a vegan world by 2026. First of all, you have to understand why we have to do this so quickly. And so that was the beginning. You know, when I realized how fast we were killing wild animals, if you look at the World Wildlife Fund Living Planet Report, it gives you statistics that tell you very clearly we have to change by 2026, otherwise we are in big trouble. When you say big trouble, what do you mean? Death and extinction. This is a very serious issue. If you're killing all the wild animals off, then we're literally killing ourselves off. It's something that we have never ever faced before as humanity. We have been living in this system of normalized violence and we've been killing animals at such a fast pace. Climate change is an amorphous issue. It's you know, methane and all sorts of things that we can't really, with our own eyes, calculate. But when I realize that we're giving planet Earth a buzz cut, that we're destroying all the forests in order to grow crops to feed tens of billions of farm animals that we kill every year, then I really got it because we're only 7.6 billion humans. Our carbon footprint is not actually that big. The Earth could easily accommodate us and maybe even a billion more or more than that. It's the animals we're eating. Meanwhile, we're running around telling each other that we're animal lovers, which is the tragic irony mm. of it all. But all those animals have to eat. People don't realize 70% or more of all soy is fed to farm animals. Corn, grain, it's all going into farm animals that then don't produce that much food. Hi, baby. Hi, sweetie. Oh, hi. I just wanted to say goodbye to you and tell you how much we love you. We're so sorry. We're so sorry, baby. In industrial agriculture, you have to you have to build things for them. You have to keep them packed tightly. You have to heat them. You have to cool them. You have to take care of their manure. Uh, you have to transport them. Uh, all of the aspects of animal agriculture add up to the single uh, biggest problem and including methane which uh, you want to call a cow fart you can. It takes eight pounds of grain to produce one pound of beef. We could stop destroying the forest, we could end world hunger, human world hunger by uh, giving that food directly to starving children and we could save all these animals and we could stop climate change if we just changed our diets. These struggle to, to find uh, land in order to grow crops, in order to feed non-human animals, is rapidly depleting the amount of forest that's left. Most people don't even think about the fact that less than a third of the Earth's surface is land. And not all of that land is even viable for agriculture. And of that 
agricultural land, about three quarters is used for animal agriculture in some way, shape, or form. It's wildly inefficient. So as a byproduct, uh, there are no places for non-human animals such as chimpanzees, gorillas, and many other species to go. It's going to lead to their extinction if it doesn't stop, and it's going to lead to their extinction soon. So what would you say to conservationists who still are eating animals? Well, you need to call yourself something else other than a conservationist. with a very special message. Inside of here is my daughter. I want her to have a good planet to live on. Not just a planet to live on, because this planet will survive us, but a good planet to live on. And part of that is internalizing what's really happening with our environment. You cannot be an environmentalist without being vegan. A vegan family here at the climate change protest. Husband, wife, and two kids, all vegan. They're also supporting the Green New Deal. What I'm starting to see here doing an informal survey is that most kids are aware of the connection between animal agriculture and climate change. When they talked about veganism or not eating animals or the problems with animal agriculture, they kept coming back to the cruelty. Even at a climate change march, that seemed to be the biggest motivator to not eat animals. My name is Perla Alvarez. So many of us are so busy um, working and finding a way to like survive in this world, but we should also find a way to protect it. And that's by going vegan and also uh, protecting the animals. They're important as well. They have feelings and I believe that the torture that they're having is horrible. I'm trying to also uh, help my family become vegan because they have health issues. Carla Veronica Alegria. I've been vegan two years now. First, it was for health reasons. My family have um, health problems like diabetes, cholesterol. So that's one of one of the main reasons I wanted to change. Working, I've been trying to get Pope Francis to go vegan for Lent. And as kids, I think this is going to be our planet. So if we want a planet, we have to do something about it. So thank you. Fight climate change with diet change. What does that mean? It means that you should go vegan because when you go vegan, it's the number one thing you can do to reduce climate change. This is Donnie Moss with AirTurn.net at the student climate strike in New York City. You can change a million light bulbs. You can turn off the water while you're brushing your teeth. But changing what is on your fork makes the biggest impact of all. If we don't do this and make huge, huge, huge changes in the next five to ten years, our kids are all going to be climate refugees. If we don't address uh, the impact that factory farming has on our planet, then it's really, we're just scratching the surface. We're overfishing the oceans, and 40% of all the fish caught in the ocean is fed to pigs and chickens and domestic salmon. So we're literally eating the oceans alive. So if we put an end to industrialized fishing, that go a long ways to allowing the ocean to repair itself. And if the ocean repairs itself, it can solve this problem, because it is the regulator of climate single greatest absorption of uh, CO2, uh, the uh, production of 70% of the production of oxygen that we breathe comes from phytoplankton and we've diminished phytoplankton populations by about 40% since 1950. So uh, these are all of these issues should be addressed but it's not getting the attention that, uh, that it deserves. The leading cause of species extinction, habitat destruction, ocean dead zones, water pollution. I think it is heartening that the teenager Greta Thunberg who started this whole youth climate movement is a vegan, convinced her family to go vegan and talks about the need for people to give up animal products in order to stop climate change. And hopefully that will become more of the messaging for the students and youth and everyone involved in this climate movement. I am very proud to stand with you here today in Hamburg. You, the German students, have made history and you should be very proud of yourselves. For way too long, 
the politicians and the people in power have gotten away with not doing anything to fight the climate crisis. But we will make sure that they will not get away with it any longer. We will continue to school strike until they do something. And we are striking because we have done our homework and they have not. And yes, we are angry. We are angry because the older generations are continuing to stealing our future right now. And they are continuing to doing this. And we will not let them do that anymore. Uh, some climate change folks begin to understand. The politicians know that uh, there are enormous agri animal agricultural interests that it's a trillion dollar industry that are arrayed against them and they have not yet decided that it's uh, that that they want to oppose them. Uh, that day is coming uh, because it has to come because uh, because a climate catastrophe is coming our way. Certificate declaring Jane Goodall Day to my personal hero since childhood, Jane Goodall. Eighty fifth birthday of legendary hero Jane Goodall. Regarding food, what would you tell consumers? I would tell consumers to eat less or no meat to move towards a plant-based diet. Can you discuss the role of animal agriculture in deforestation and habitat destruction? Well, in a, in a nutshell, animal agriculture, where animals are kept in these intensive factory farms, one is shockingly cruel. And we have to realize that farm animals, too, have personalities and emotions can feel happiness and, and uh, fear. But also, to feed all the billions of animals that are now kept in these conditions, it means destroying environments to grow the grain to feed them, which means the use of much fossil fuel, giving out CO2 emissions, adding to the greenhouse gases and climate change. It uses a lot of water. In addition to all of that, the animals produce methane gas as a byproduct of digestion, and that is a very vicious greenhouse gas. And finally, uh, these creatures are given antibiotics just to keep them alive, not, not necessarily because they're sick, and the bacteria are building up resistance, and as we destroy the forests and other habitats, it means that we are actually stealing the future of our children because we are part of the natural world, we need the natural world and we're destroying it so fast. Unless we all get together now, it will be too late. Wherever you are on this journey, I hope that I can help you through the kind diet or the kind mama in terms of just the, we, we our best way to get everyone on board is to be our most vibrant, healthy selves and to feel our best. We're walking billboards, right? If you feel good and you look good, people want to know what you're up to, right? And so being that your healthiest version of yourself is the way forward. And if you can, hopefully with the kind diet, I can help you to just get more in the superhero zone so you feel your best. And depending on anywhere you are, I welcome you. If you eat meat all the time and you just start eating less of it, we are so grateful for that choice. Not only the animals are grateful for that choice, your body is grateful for that choice, the earth is grateful for that choice and obviously the people who are starving all over the world. We have 10 years to turn it around. I don't know how aware everyone is of what a serious situation climate change is. So every time you eat a plant-based meal, you can pat yourself on the back. It's the most powerful thing you can do. You know, when you're vegan, one thing that I found was that all my vegan friends, one of their regrets was that they didn't go vegan sooner. And for me, my regret as an activist is that I didn't become active sooner. And I see a lot of heads nodding. I really invite you to make a commitment in your life to not just be vegan and be like, I'm not going to take part in the system, but I'm going to use my life, I'm going to use my time and energy to actually make a difference because that will make a difference. And let me tell you that by being involved in the community, I'm 100% convinced that we will see a vegan world within our lifetime. So we are here to start the ball rolling for a vegan world by 2026. <laughs> You know, 
why we are doing this. And you don't have to go through the negative side of this at all. We have to do this because we are not a monumentally stupid species. <laughs> Clearly, the system of normalized violence is going to end, whether we like it or not. It's going to end because the Earth is saying it's no more. This is PCH at 5 p.m. tonight. It's just unbelievable. I mean, th the trees are going up in flames. Within eight years, climate change is going to be crazy. It is telling us, the Earth is telling us we have to change. And there is this one light that you see at the end of the tunnel. And you see that light, and that's Nonviolence. If you have a system of normalized nonviolence in place, everything will be fine. The planet will be fine, we'll be fine, the animals will be fine. So we have that solution and we just have to go grab it and take it, right? And, and build the structure around it so that we can now transition to that. You're one of the founders of the internet, one of the creators of the internet, and you then began working with Al Gore. What happened? Why did you leave him? He didn't want to talk about animal agriculture at all, and I thought that we are doing a disservice to the people if you don't tell them what is going on. And animal agriculture has a, such a huge impact on climate change, and it's not being addressed at all. He became vegan, and from what I hear, everything, all the food there is vegan when people come for training. But there is so much fear about mm -hmm. upsetting the system, about upsetting the people who, are, who have the money in the system. Mm -hmm. There's so much fear. It's a fear-driven system that we have now. Basically, people are being coerced into just continuing along the same path. You're also one of the people behind two incredible documentaries, Cowspiracy and What the Health. Processed meat has officially been determined by the World Health Organization to be cancer-causing. That's just official. That means bacon, hot dogs, deli slices, uh, ham slices, you know, all the things, the way people eat meat. Exactly. Now, if you saw a parent feeding a cigarette to their kid, you'd say, let me call child services. There's something wrong here. But these parents are shoving these nuggets down these kids' throats mm. and they don't see anything wrong with it, but it's cancer causing. How do we fight all that? We are dealing with a system that's aligned against us. What I'm suggesting we do is we build a new one rather than fighting the old one. Yeah. This is how you create change. You know, Buckminster Fuller said that very clearly. Yeah. So instead of changing the old, just build the new. Show people how good it is in the new. And then they will come along and say, I want to be there, not where I am. So as more and more people come yeah. with us, then the majority will say, well, we should be there too. You know, because everyone is going that way. So it becomes like a trend. And so we are a herd animal, you know, we just go along with the herd. Gandhi has shown that one person can make a difference, mm -hmm. make a huge difference. The pig trial has increased awareness about the individuality and suffering of pigs going to slaughter and the imperative of going vegan and not looking away when an animal is in need. But we need to go further. The law needs to recognize pigs and all animals as persons, not property. Pigs should not be given the degrading status of property. They are someone. They have feelings. They're sentient. They're self-aware. They have complex personalities, just like you and me, just like dogs. I hope this case encourages more people to bear witness at a slaughterhouse in their community. In fact, I think he's shown that it's only through a few people that all changes happen. It isn't uh, groups of people. It's just one person makes this unreasonable stand and says, no, I don't want this to happen anymore. I want to change this and then people start coalescing a person. Use the life that you have to create a world where compassion, tolerance and equality are no longer considered extreme or militant, but are instead the foundations and baseline for a just and fair society. So this is how really how all change happens. So Gandhi did that in India 100 years ago, and now he tried to create a system of normalized nonviolence too. But in his case, he really didn't have all the tools and technologies that we do today. Ryuji Chua, social media influencer, you wanted to talk about that. If you look at what's happening today, and you look at who kids are looking up to, the next generation, they're looking up at social media influencers. They're looking up to people who just put out content on the internet. I'm a hip hop artist, social entrepreneur, uh, creative activist. I've been vegan for almost two years now. In two months, 
dropped 20 pounds, my blood pressure went all the way in the green, my my mental health, my spiritual health, I just felt so much cleaner. So sometimes you'll see people who are famous on the internet. These are not traditional media celebrities. These are social media influencers. Hi, my name is James Aspie. I'm a vegan animal rights activist from Sydney, Australia, well known for taking a year-long vow of silence for the animals. You can check out his videos on YouTube. James, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself for our viewers? Yeah, I'm somebody who grew up not really understanding who animals were, so I didn't really like them, I didn't think their lives had any value, and therefore I thought it was pointless to give any consideration to their feelings, their emotions, their lives in general. I ate meat every single day for my whole life, I didn't feel bad about it at all. I watched footage of animals being slaughtered, I still felt no shame, all because I felt you need to eat animals to survive and be healthy. When I learned finally that you can actually live and thrive on a vegan diet, in fact live longer and reduce your chances of developing many diseases, basically just live a much healthier life, then I questioned, well if we don't need to kill animals to survive and thrive, what do we do it for? And when I realized that there's no justification in the violence that's any better than because we like how they taste, I realized I was totally out of alignment with the person I was striving to be, which is a compassionate, respectful, loving, basically just a non-violent person. I don't think it's okay to go and stab somebody to death. So why is it okay for me to pay somebody to stab somebody to death? And if you look at the crowds of people around them, it's insane. They get more public attention than many traditional media celebrities. We are here today for the calves taken away from their mothers. We are here today for the hens who are exploited for their eggs. We are here today for the chickens who are exploited and murdered for their flesh. We are here today for the pigs who are locked in farrowing crates. We are here today for the lambs on the way to the slaughterhouse. And we are here today for the millions upon trillions of animals who are mercilessly dragged out of the ocean. The marine animals who are killed without any dignity or respect. They haven't gone through gatekeepers, and so that could be anyone. That could be me, that could be you, that could be anyone. And we have to understand that so many people are gonna do things because the people that they look up to do the same things, and we can become those people. We can just take a two minute video of, of us talking, or of some slaughterhouse footage, or of a conversation during the Cuba Truth, and it can reach millions of people. I've had videos reach 13 million people, 12 million people, people all over the world like that, with a thought, with a photo, with a video, with a meal, a vegan meal recipe, with information. And people are getting educated and informed at a rate that has never been seen before. By me putting out content on the internet and being like, hey, this is what I'm about. I'm vegan, this is my life, my life is awesome, I have awesome friends. People can see that and look up to that and be like, wow, that's cool, I want to do that too. And the reason I think social media is so important too is because of this idea of tribes. Today we have this opportunity to change the world by creating communities. I'm not gonna get to the whole world as one person. There's 7.6 billion people in the world. I can't speak to everyone. But what if I can speak to a thousand people and I can not only speak to them, but empower them to create their own community. And then they can empower their community to create more communities. And in that way we can really spread a movement. I'm married to a multi-generational cattle rancher. I went vegan October 31st, 2014. What happened is I started questioning my husband. I started wondering why we weren't uh, eating our own animals. You know, we always bought meat from the store and we sold the babies to the cell barn. I want to know why we don't eat our own animals. And he said, because I know them, Renee. And that didn't ring right for me. It took about four years of pressure from me to my husband for me to finally draw the line in the sand where I could no longer participate in the violence and the cruelty of sending the baby calves to the cell barn. You know, we are creating a new model that other ranchers are going to naturally want to gravitate to because the old paradigm isn't working. You know, uh, dairy farmers are committing suicide. You hear about it all the time. The environment is being ravaged by all these hurricanes. So these animals are being drowned and insurance uh, companies are having to come in and constantly uh, overtake, you know, and help these uh, ranchers out again, one more bailout after another. So ranchers are, are, are looking, they just do not know what to do. This chicken farmer cattle rancher family in the heart of chicken ranch country has gone vegan. They used to send to slaughter 100,000 chickens every 52 days. Get your mind around this. They have a cattle ranch operation, beautiful cows. Right now they have 205 
cows that they refuse to send to slaughter, cattle rancher, chicken farmers gone vegan. So we are in one of the most biodiverse regions of the world. About 5% of the biodiversity of the planet is supposed to be in this region. And it is being cut down and turned into cattle ranches. So you can see, you know, cows. This has become like the cattle ranching capital. This is why I think it's important for us to come to Costa Rica and help them reverse this situation so that the biodiversity is preserved. He who has a why to live for can endure almost anyhow. This is why the why is so important. If you have been studying what's going on in the environment, the why becomes almost obvious. We know why we have to have a vegan world. In 2009, I was at this sanctuary in the Western Ghats of India. I got the most depressed at that sanctuary because I saw how beautiful nature is. You just leave nature alone and you get back the forest. We just take human beings out. All other species are happy. They create a beautiful forest. They drop their seeds and new trees are born. And here we are, we take everything and we flush it down the toilet somewhere and it goes, you know. <laughs> so the way we are interacting with nature, it looks like we don't belong. It turns out that in the last three million years, the earth has been going through so many glacial periods and interglacial periods. So ice ages. And during an ice age, life struggles to survive. Life literally dies out because it's covered by ice. So 90,000 years you get this ice age and then for 10,000 years you get this interglacial period where the ice retreats and life expands. Over the last 12,000 years or so, we came out of the previous ice age and into the current interglacial period and for the last 10,000 years, the temp temperature has stayed pretty constant. And the reason is that human beings started burning down forests. And this is what we have done over the last 10,000 years. Unknowingly, we kept the temperature constant over the last 10,000 years. So that the Earth did not go back to an ice age 6,000 years ago. So in that sense, the world as we know it was created 6,000 years ago. That's when humans took over the climate of the planet. And in the last 200 years, we discovered fossil fuels. And we dug them up and we burnt them. So that's also carbon. That's stored carbon from all the trees that lived millions of years ago. So we took them out and we burnt them. And in the process, we have raised it. The carbon dioxide levels have now come to over 410 parts per million. So the Earth is getting hotter as a result of that. The earth is getting hotter, we are killing animals, we are destroying forests still. And so we have no choice but to return the forest. Okay, when you return the forest, you can sequester all that extra carbon that's in the atmosphere back on the ground. You'll give back land for the animals to recover. All that carbon that we have put from the fossil fuels will stay in the atmosphere and it will keep the temperature constant. So we can return the temperature back to what it was 200 years ago and bring life back. That's the only way out that we have. That's the only way out where I see light. To me, it's as if nature has said, you now understand what's going on. You now know you have to bring back life. Okay? That's the only way you are going to survive. Otherwise, you are also going to die. And we are the thermostat species for the planet. It's our job as human beings to maintain conditions of climate and weather, the environment for all life to flourish. So I was just uh, looking at that beautiful tree. It's a tall one, it's called uh, Mountain Guarumo. It's funny how it fights to get light, then it flourishes beautifully. We are at the Nicoya Peninsula, that is in the northern area of Costa Rica and we are exactly between the Nicoya Gulf and the uh, Pacific Ocean. So the mission of Vegan World 2026 is to co-create a culture of normalized non-violence. So we are on top of a hill that used to be coffee farms and cattle ranches, and it has now been turned into a native forest. 
and the idea is to understand how to live in harmony with nature so that we are not running away from animals, we are not running away from spiders or killing them off when they come into our homes. We, we are figuring out how to live in harmony with nature. We have to transition to a way of living where we can return land back to nature, bring back the forest, bring back the wild animals so that we can sequester carbon, heal the climate and solve the biodiversity loss issue. So essentially returning Earth back to its pristine form, you know, Eden, back to nature. We are taking care of animals as opposed to constantly killing them, which is what we are doing now. I mean, the conditions are right for a rainbow. Uh, the sun is just peeking out. Critical mass is less than 3% of a population moving in a particular direction. There is no way to humanely kill an animal. When you become a vegan, you are actually regaining your purpose. Awakening to Survival 2026. We envision a world of love, unity, and abundance, but this requires us to change course at this perilous time. Since 1970, more than half of wild animals have been killed. At the rate we are killing wildlife, we will virtually have no wild animals left by the year 2026. This loss means whales, penguins, monkeys, koala bears, tigers, eagles, giraffes. None of these animals would be left except in zoos. This is the biggest crisis of our lifetime because it threatens our very existence. This horrific milestone will mark an ecological turning point. Year Zero will present unimaginable extreme weather on a scale that the human race has never experienced. Extreme drought, massive wildfires, flood events. That extreme weather will in turn trigger political and societal disruption and chaos as millions are displaced and become refugees. From cities to rural areas, land and homes will become uninhabitable. Animal agriculture is the leading cause of global deforestation, habitat destruction, soil degradation, wildlife extinction, and ocean dead zones because it's so resource intensive and highly inefficient. Animals eat almost 40 times what they produce as meat, dairy, or eggs. 83% of agricultural land is currently used for raising farm animals for food. The good news is more than 80% of the food humans consume is already plant-based. Less than 20% of the food humans consume is meat, dairy, and eggs. When we reduce that percentage to zero by 2026, we will have made substantial progress towards reversing climate change, wildlife extinction, and deforestation. Thereby preventing year zero. It is totally unnecessary to eat animals for health or survival. Following a plant-based lifestyle can reverse and prevent 14 of the 15 leading causes of death. Due to the increasing variety of plant-based food options, it is now easier than ever to go vegan. Therefore, it is totally unnecessary to exploit, enslave, torture and kill animals, or to engage in institutionalized animal abuse. We reject the system of forced breeding, mutilation and killing of the animals. We demand the system of normalized violence be replaced by a system of normalized nonviolence. We commit to supporting this vision and to assist in the joy and wellness of all beings through a vegan lifestyle. Our guiding principles are, one, all animals have the inalienable right to live free of exploitation, forced breeding, torture, and slaughter. Two, we reject the idea that religious beliefs, cultural traditions, and economic arguments are valid reasons for denying them these inalienable rights. Three, we believe in the intersectionality of these basic rights with inalienable human rights. Compassion for all life is infinitely sustainable. Our demands, government stop subsidizing animal agriculture and start promoting organic plant agriculture. Two, media report the truth about animal agriculture's devastating impact on human health, the environment, and our fellow creatures. We plead, one, environmental, conservation, health, animal welfare and religious organizations adopt a public vegan policy. Two, consumers stop buying animal products.
I'm so grateful to all of you, all of you, for coming together to start this process off. I went through something very similar with the internet. We did exactly the same thing during the internet era. A whole bunch of people got together and we decided to create these documents that list out the best practices for how do you make any connection on the internet. In most cases, we just took what was already there and said that seemed to be the best way to do it. And we endorsed it. And wherever they didn't know how to do it, we actually set up a task force and we figured out how to do it. How are y'all doing? Good, yeah? Our question was within the workforce development umbrella. And the question was, how do we provide jobs for those leaving slaughterhouses and other animal harming jobs? Nobody wants to work at a slaughterhouse. It's alternative production. And when you're good with your hands, farmers of old could do anything. There's a tremendous commonality between chicken farming and mushroom farming. One of the answers is, is going to be grassroots, literally, like individuals being there, boots on the ground. So if we, as vegans, we go to them, walk with them. Here's a bridge. Come and spend your life working to save the animals. If we act to the same process, you know, we have these incredible companies uh, which are plant based. So our group came up with, I think, a really exciting campaign idea to start a campaign that gets plant based companies to offer first right of refusal for jobs to current slaughterhouse workers. Isn't that cool? So the way it worked uh, this weekend, we basically identified questions in different areas. You know, what are the questions we have? How do we make the transition? So it's all about how, because we know what to do. We know where we are doing it, when we are doing it, why we are doing it. So all the other questions we have answered is only how do we do it? So we broke it down into pieces and 100 people are coming together and asking questions. You get a variety of questions. You get this diversity. It's impossible for one person to ever, ever do that. Mm. And then people can walk around and say, okay, I'd like to address that question. I want to work on that question. So then we create these study groups around these questions that haven't been answered. How do we end subsidizing animal products for food? And as a corollary, how do we get animal agriculture to pay for their fair share of land and water that they use? One of the main problems is this intrinsic marriage between government and industry. We have, for example, the USDA is this revolving door organization that governs big ag, but most of the people that are in leadership positions are former big ag employees or executives. And then the study groups become formal task forces, so we can then go off and figure out what are the best practices for addressing these questions. So then everyone has an opportunity to start a study group in the larger community. If the larger community wants that to become a task force, it becomes a task force. And then we come up with the recommendations. And then we have a cohesive set of recommendations as to how this new system of normalized nonviolence looks like. Talk about an issue that is really verboten in mainstream advertiser-based radio or television. And that is how we're killing the planet with animal agriculture. And why is it verboten? If you look at the industries that advertise, fast food, pharmaceuticals, a lot of the industries that would collapse if people got healthy, switched to a plant-based diet. The world that we are in now is based on normalized violence, which is really about killing things off. And we are killing things off at such a fast mm -hmm. pace that we are in danger of killing ourselves as well. That's a frenzied rate of killing. And all because we are making money. Somebody is making money off of all this killing. We are live at a vigil for pigs. We have to wait until the truck stops. number of people who are here giving water till the very last second so that these animals can they're all gonna die they're all gonna go to their deaths right now yeah that meet your bacon meet your bacon meet your ham meet your hot dogs they had mothers 
Wake up, oh. wake up. Oh my god. What what runs through you when you see them? Just absolutely sad and distraught. I feel like people need to know that this is the reality. People need to know that this is where their food comes from and that these creatures experience pain every every single moment of their lives until the very end. And we're just here to show them love and, and compassion in their last moments. Some of them don't ever get to see any sort of human interaction of kindness. So we have a system that's based on, you know, making money of death, disease and destruction. You know, death for the animals, disease for human beings and destruction for the planet. Oh. That's the system that we are in because it's a system based on fear, it's based on war, continuous war, endless war. It's all about violence. It's a very violent system. And so nature is now telling us if we don't stop this, and change to a system of normalized non-violence by 2026, you're done. And why do you come out? I come out for a variety of reasons. Um, I come out truck, to support this community um, and to draw attention to it. I come out to document it so that I can share it on social media. But also, I come out to remind myself that Animals are not an abstraction, you know? A lot of times we live in urban and suburban environments and we only deal with animals, we deal with pictures of animals, we deal with videos of animals, and we sometimes need to be reminded that animals are 100% flesh and blood sensitive sentient creatures. And sometimes that can be accomplished by visiting a sanctuary which is a much happier way of being reminded of the physical reality of animals. But sometimes nights when they have like truck after truck after truck, just being reminded that that's the reality for over 100 billion animals on the planet. I've been a vegan now for 31 years, and animal rights is my life's work. And one of the wonderful things about being an animal rights activist is most people already love animals. All we have to do is create that connection. People love their love dogs, they love cats, they love other animals, but like extending that compassion, extending that connection to all animals, that's kind of our job. We just have to remind them that cows and pigs and chickens and these are just as much sentient sensitive animals as the you know, their companion animals. Ideally anyone who's concerned or interested should come out and see the reality of the animals that they're eating. This is horrific. Oh my god. Oh my god. This is horrific. And this is what it looks like to allow yourself to feel the pain of fellow being. So it's called empathy, and we're, we're, we're lacking in it. The reason that we're all here today is because we take responsibility. When you see something that's wrong with the world or with your life or with anything, it's always your responsibility to make a difference. That's what being a leader is. So when it comes to this, when it's like something that happens on a global scale and the responsibility is so diffused because you're like, yo, we're like 7.6 billion people in the world, so why would I step up to make a difference? And when you have that kind of situation, most people will not take responsibility. The people who do step up and take responsibility, those are the people that will be celebrated as visionaries in the future. How is it that you have such confidence that we're going to be able to achieve this? History is full of ex examples of things that shifted. So I'm saying we have to shift now, so let's work on it. Let's get it done. And give yeah. us some examples of what you think the parallels are. With the internet, it was, you know, in eight years, we went from something that nobody really knew to something that everyone thought they absolutely had to have in their life. And it was just eight years, you know, from 1995 to 2003. I witnessed it happen. Moon landing was also something that, like that. In 1962, Kennedy, when he made that speech at Rice University in, in Texas, <laughs> A lot of people scoffed at him, saying, you, know, you want to put a man on the moon? But then it inspired the Americans, and within eight years, within seven years, actually, man was on the moon, right, in 1969. So there again, it was just breaking, breaking down the larger problem into smaller pieces and addressing each one of them and putting it together. That's what NASA did. 
we are on the right side of history. We're on the ethical side of history, so this is gonna be over. And then most people are gonna flip when social pressures flip the other way and many people start being vegan and it starts being an actual thing. And people will be like, oh, most people are doing it, I'll do it too. Then people like us, who now, a lot of people call us heretics, a lot of people call us crazy, like all this kind of stuff. Then you'll see that in 20, 30 years, you'll have all our friends hitting us up being like, yo, you're a visionary. And that's what we're gonna get. And that's 100%. Yeah, it is historic. I do believe one day we will look back, first of all, on what we do to animals and all hang our heads in shame, just like vegans do now about how we used to contribute to it. But that'll be not just 2% of the population, it'll be 99% of the population. My name is Mario Fabry, and right now I host a cooking show called Drying Vegan with Mario. A quarter cup of this nutritional yeast on top, that's gonna add in that cheesy flakiness, a lot of pesto, normally made with Parmesan cheese. We switch it out for some hemp seeds and some nutritional yeast much healthier for you. We're cutting dairy out. But growing up, I actually worked at my dad's Italian sausage factory, was raised on the standard American diet, and there was no real way around it. Everything my friends, my family, everything that people were eating was largely meat and cheese. And then I got to a point where I started to learn and be able to make my own food decisions. Maybe the food that we've grown up on, maybe the stuff that we've been told to eat, isn't actually looking out for our best interests. Heart disease is one of the number one killers in the United States. As soon as you hear that and you make the connection that that is from cholesterol, cholesterol that comes from animals, it, you just put two and two together. It's inevitable that their industry will go away. It will end. So if, if they were smart, even business-wise, they would listen to us when we're telling them their industry has no future. The planet can't sustain it and human consciousness will not go along with it. We're evolving too quickly. Vegan companies like Beyond Meat are now going public. And this is where the smart money is going. We are hitting the tipping point. Feel it. Believe it. The change is coming. The sun will one day set on this world and a new dawn will rise. Out of the ashes of violence, hope will rise. Now we as a movement exist in the millions of individuals, but together we move as one. And as one, we cannot be stopped. We will not be stopped. And these industries, the ones who exploit others fear us, and they should fear us. For every single day, our numbers grow stronger, our conviction grows harder, and that change becomes ever more inevitable than it was the day previous. And they fear us because they know that we will not stop fighting, that we will never take a day's rest, and we will never take a day's break until the animals are liberated from the shackles that our species has imprisoned them within. But, I... but the fight that we face is not a fight of violence. It's not a fight against nations or religions. It is a fight against ignorance and apathy. And the only weapon that we need is the truth and a voice from which we are obliged to speak it. And we must speak that truth. With every second of life that we are given, we must speak that truth. The world that we want, that vegan world, exists out there in front of us in the palm of our hands. And all we have to do is reach out and take it. It's not going to be given to us. No one is going to hand it to us, but there it exists in front of each and every one of us, waiting for us to seize it. So feel it, believe in it, see it, manifest it, but importantly, create it. The future will one day speak of a seemingly small group of people who saw the world for the violent place that it was and said that they would no longer only talk about ending suffering and oppression. They would instead demand it. We represent a worldwide movement and we will not relent until total animal liberation is achieved! <laughs> And in that moment, when those demands were met, humanity looked to the things they'd done to non-human animals with disgust, disdain, and with guilt. And they said, non-human persons, the lives of non-human persons should be treated the same value and respect they were assigned to our own lives. We all know what this is. This is the corpse of a living creature Someone's a baby, a sentient being like us, with thoughts and feelings 
and their destiny. And it's taken from millions of animals every year in the name of our, that we can't possibly live without eating meat. It's not possible. I can't do it. I can't become a vegan. I can't take responsibility for this industry. I can't take responsibility for this planet. And what it represents to the people who did this is just money in some corporation's profit in their pocket. It's not hopeless, like people are saying. We need to have a chance to reverse climate change. We have a chance to reverse biodiversity loss. We have a chance to stop all the wildfires. We have a chance to stop the ice from melting. People are in alignment with this mission. They will listen to us if we say, you know, if we just reduce consuming animals, you can actually bring back the forest. What we are talking about here is a cultural change. I mean, look at me. I'm traveling 300 days a year around the world. I'm lecturing sometimes twice a day. Uh, and I'm 85. I haven't eaten meat since the beginning of the 70s or the end of 69. You feel lighter, you feel stronger, you have more health, and I totally recommend it. All of us know what the moral position is. The moral position is to resist this and to end it. Organize, resist, persist.